The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Welcome to the show. Owen. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a good chat. We're talking ETFs, we're talking disruption, we're talking technology, all different types of stuff. Um, but you haven't been on the show before. So um, what I might do is I might start with some icebreakers. Yeah. We, m- we first met a little while back. We went to lunch at Lucy Lou in Melbourne. So here we're in Sydney. So I'm in your hometown. Um, what's the best restaurant in Sydney? Oh, look, I'd love to be able to tell you. Um, and for those Sydney siders, it's probably like quite patriotic. You know, I, 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 I didn't live in the north. People live in the east. We don't we don't get to cross pollinate much. Okay. Um, but look, I've got two young kids, oh, and like the ability to go to a restaurant is essentially zero. So it's it's funny because um, <laughs> yeah, my daughter, my oldest daughter, is seven, and um, she her birthday was sort of around August, and I said, okay, well, we get you can go anywhere you want. I'm, and as a kid, I don't know exactly what she's gonna say, and her her answer was the pub. So I don't know what, what that means for what, what I've done to my children. Um, so anyway, like I, I live in Manly, so we went down to, if you want a particular name, I went down to there's a, there's a pub on the beach called The Stain, uh, which people from, oh, from, yeah. from the northern beaches oh, yes. would know pretty well. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's my one tip if yeah. you've got kids. Okay. Who I love like chips. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I like it. All right, here's a more technical question. but um, And we could go on about this for forever, but it is an icebreaker, so I will – uh, add that disclaimer in there. What percentage of Australian investors' portfolios will be invested in ETFs by 2030 versus should be invested in ETFs by 2030? So I think for my sins, oh, like I was a, an advisor for a long time before <clears throat> moving into ETFs. And I think it's always going to be careful because every every advisor is sorry, every investor is different. Yeah, you've got investors who are retirees, who, their their portfolios look very different than than someone who's coming into the game as a younger investor. But I think if you take it from the perspective of you can build a portfolio with ETFs only, still be you know diversified, mm. have a nice asset allocation program, whether it's in your super fund, whether it's um, personally, if you take a bit of lead off the US, and we, I just actually saw a stat this morning, you know they they are they're using ETFs from a portfolio perspective around sort of sixty percent. Hmm. The, the trading in ETFs in the US now is is again this is not a perfect number. This is based on one day, but you can circa 20 to 25 percent a day in terms wow. of volumes compare that to australia it's five percent so you've got you know i think to, the, 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 to answer the question you know if we've got seven years to go I, I would suspect to see that trading possibly double and then on the back of that you would suspect to see you know holdings to double and the hope with the hope that they're long-term holdings. So that's what ETFs are really built around. Mm. Yeah, we're just talking off here about how some ETFs are used for trading, but for the most part, yeah, long-term investing. Um, okay, final uh, icebreaker, mate, which is a bit of an interesting one. I've never asked this on the program before, so you're the first. If you could have one learned skill or talent or ability, like something realistic, so not like you're invisible or something like that, but something like, a, I don't know, if, if you have a hobby that you could then improve on, uh, what would it be? I think um, this is pretty specific. Because again, I've got, we just mentioned, I've got a couple of kids. And when you work, you know, work in the city, it's got a lot better getting home with the traffic these days. But my wife would definitely say, if I could 
do dinner more. And when I, <laughs> what, what I mean by that, let me clarify. <laughs> I have zero creativity when it comes to cooking. So I can tell you, again, from my former life as an advisor working in ETFs, he's had to build a portfolio. He's had to put those ingredients together to have something that, that works. No hope when it comes to cooking. Like if you gave me five ingredients to go make something, it's just not going to work. So um, I wish I was much better at that, as, as does my whole family. <laughs> well, it's you and me both, mate. Like, okay, uh, I always think if there's like a steak, I'm like, I've got to eat the steak. It's got to be cooked. So what's the quickest time I can get it from here to there? And unfortunately, that doesn't really work. <laughs> no. I oh, like your efficiency model, though. It's a good one yeah. as well. And that's how I certainly play it out. Yeah. Different when you have kids too. Um, so, mate, GlobalX um, bought ETF Securities. It's like kind of like this global business that's now arriving here in Australia and it's coming in a big way. Um You've been with the business for quite a few months now. What does your role entail exactly? Like for people that are new to what you're doing, um, it's head of investment strategy, right? Yeah. So I think for, for very quickly before we dive into that, I think just <clears throat> from, the ex, from the explanation of what GlobalX is. Um, so yes, we, we, we have essentially merged the ETF securities business, rebranded it to GlobalX. So GlobalX is, um, is essentially a US-based business. It's, you know, globally, we've got offices across the across the world to London, uh, Sao Paulo, um, obviously now Australia, which is which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, circa around sixty billion Australian dollars in terms of assets under management. Now, that's not going to even compare to the, the Black Rocks of the world or the Vanguards, but we are a bit more specific around what we're doing. Mm-hmm. We're not trying to compete with those um, those type of ETF players. Cause, you know, we know what they do and they do it really well. So, where we are. Where we think we, we you know, do really well, where we, where we think we provide the best solutions is probably more what we're probably going to talk about today is the thematic space. Yep. <clears throat> That's something that we're really, we're really strong on. Uh, what we also do a lot of is commodities. So ETF security is obviously very well known for gold. That's now the Global X Gold ETF. And we're going to build that out. We want to give people choice around commodities because really what's the best way for, a, for an investor to play, if you're not an institutional investor, to play commodities? It is likely through an ETF. Yeah. Um, and whether that's sort of an equity, you know, commodity builder by the miners or on the physical, um, there's a couple of ways to do that. I think the third one, and this is certainly because we know Australians, so when super funds, it's probably income. So giving giving income choices to investors. So we're going to have sort of those those three pillars. Yep. Um, what does my role entail as head of uh, investment strategy? It's really trying to bring to life the research that we're generating, certainly out of the US, um, and give it to investors to make it relatable, make it digestible. So let me give you an example of that. I think, you know, we've got a sort of 30 person circa research team yep. uh, in the US with a heavy focus on thematics. So when, when you what you get from, you know, whether it's uh, the BlackRock, again, the, the iShares or the Vanguards, they do really, really good research, but it probably is more at that macro level. Um, they mm. provide you with some asset allocation views. They'll, they'll give you some content that is, that is certainly relevant and important, but they're probably not, playing in the space of that bottom-up research on a, say, a particular thematic. It's not necessarily with anyway. So what we do is we want to make sure that that research is deep because investors like that you, that you talk to all the time probably have the multiple sources, you know, whether it's a podcast, mm. whatever it may be, that we want to just bring that to life. So part of the job that I'm, that, um, that I'm entailed to do and tasked to do is to help translate that research. You know, it is essentially institutional quality, like bring that down and make it relevant for Australian investors, and whether that's across the whole range of thematics that we can play into. So it might, if, if it is a space, and we can talk about this later if you want, like electric vehicles, the ability, the, the future of that. You know, we know lithium's really big in Australia. We've got some miners that have played out here. <clears throat> so people sort of are across that yeah. compared to, say, the US, but they're maybe not across that part of the world, but they are much more across the electric vehicle space. So that whole supply chain is how do we bring that together to make it really relevant? Mm. And that's an exciting role for you too because you've got that research backing You've got the the team in Australia that executes on it, um, and then you get to sit kind of like as the linchpin between them and articulate that and bring that, as you said, like bring this. This is what we're talking about today. We're talking about like disruption today, right? And you get yeah. to bring that to the forum like this, and it's really exciting. Um, so let's just let's dive into that. Um, a lot of people, like I get heaps of questions from the RAS community from everywhere that I, I go. People are like, what do you think of this? Like there are like beta. There's like beta that you can buy for basically free these days, right? It's so cheap. Um, but then when it comes to thematic ETFs, that's where people are genuinely curious mm. about things. They're like, well, lithium 
gold, whatever the case may be. Maybe not gold, not so much a thematic ETF, but they think you know this is exciting, this is interesting, <clears throat> and I have a view on this. But then you sitting behind the scenes, you're the one that has to create this and bring this to the market, yeah. right? So I guess the question is, how do you, people on the investor side of the table relate to you designing these things? Like, how do you make sure that what you're building is a legitimate theme that should be exploited versus something that's like, you know, um, something that's just going to be a fad or just fade yeah. away. I think it's a really valid question. And I think the way that we do it, and I'll walk you through, it's kind of, it's a, obviously a process. Yep. I think stacks up from the investor side as their own process to do their own due diligence when it comes to how they think they should invest in a certain thematic right. or, or anything really. <clears throat> because I think when you think about thematics, you're not necessarily buying an off-the-shelf index. So, <clears throat> again, if you want to, you know, if you want to have an ASX 200 index or an SP 500, they're they're already established. They, they've been they've been yeah. built for many years. Um, so, if you're an ETF business, what you're going to do is you're going to go. We well, just want to license that particular index. We'll bring that. You know, indexes aren't investable, but ETFs are. So, here's the ability to invest through that index. Again, valid, really, really important to have as part of portfolios. With thematic sides, so a different. It's a whole different ball game. In that, what we what we do is essentially we're building the research and understanding what a couple of things. What are our true thematics, mm -hmm. and what clients need and what they want. So investors, advisors, institutions, whoever, whoever, whoever may that, and then working to bring those those type of thematics to life again in an investable process. Because what you're going to get <clears throat> as a discrepancy between a thematic and a broad-based index is much more around things like revenue purity. And, you know, it's pretty obvious what I mean by that is you, you want to be, if you're buying a thematic that is, again, we'll use the same sort of um, uh, example as before around, you know, electric vehicles. If you're going to do that, you want to know that what your exposure is is not so broad that you're getting things that maybe just touch electric vehicles on the side but are going to skew what your return looks like because they're not really exposed to it. So. What that might that example might be if you're in electric vehicles, you know, there's cases where something like Apple might be in the index because they obviously have potential with CarPlay, they might have potential with you know what they're doing in their own electric vehicle space. But again, what's their revenue look like from a perspective mm -hmm. potential of, of, of that? <clears throat> so I think there's, there's that. So let, let me go back to the points of how we think about it. So one, we have to be, we have to be, and again, again, investors should take this on board themselves around how they should think. Not advice per se, but it's more a framework. Mm. Got to be high conviction. So we need to be highly convicted that this is an actual proper theme. And when we break down themes so under this sort of first point, we've got sort of three buckets. Um, we've got the first bucket being disruptive technology. So this is something we can, again, we can discuss. Yep. The second one is the changing dynamics of, of people and uh, and geographies and those sort of areas, you know, which we can, you know, which might be e-commerce, something along those lines. And the third one is um, the physical environment. So that might sort of encapsulate climate change. So, they, so, so this is the three buckets. Yep. From those three buckets, they're not, they're not really investable. They're too they're too broad. You want to go down the next next layer under those buckets, and that'll give you the theme that you want to play into. So. If it is disruptive technology, it might be electric vehicles, as an example. Um, if it's um, people demographics, is the changes. Uh, an interesting one we have in the states is uh, as a cannabis ETF. Hmm. Now we we debated a long time if that's the right thing to do. You know, is it right, for, especially for a brand? We, we need to take yeah. this stuff very seriously. The, that legalization process that's happening globally um, gives you much more confidence in that. And we just saw, I think it was last week, when Biden basically pardoned everyone. On marijuana convictions in the states, this is so. This is the shift, and that's not in the case in Australia. So, yep. um, uh, but that's yeah, that's an, again an area that's moving. That's where the trend and the theme is happening. And then I think in the third bucket, which is physical environment, again we can discuss this. Is that sort of change around renewable energy? Um, it's the change on infrastructure and what's happening in that space. So, again, these need to be those that and that's that third bucket. So we're going to be high committed what that is. Mm -hmm. The second one, I think this is really important. I think many of your listeners would know this already, but it has to actually be investable. Like you've got to be able to actually buy a broad range of publicly listed companies mm. that give you, as I mentioned earlier, like proper revenue exposure to this particular thematic. And the important part here, I think, is, and we've seen a little bit of history of this, and you're probably well aware, that you don't want to be in companies that are too small 
or you know, in terms of their market caps are too small because if your ETF happens to catch on and people really like it and, and what that thematic is is relevant, you have the ability to have that flow on effect and move the underlying price of that particular company. So mm. you, you might have known a couple of years ago out of the US there was a clean energy ETF. Yep. Um, and it, it essentially got so big and the flows got so strong that it started to have flow on effects and move the underlying securities, which then obviously has a flow on effect because it moves the ETF. And that's great on the upside, but when it all came crashing down, that's you know it's a spiral effect. So you don't ever want to be in a position where what you're doing is creating more more pain or more accentuating you know what the ETF is doing. So you, you basically want to institute um, sort of restrictions on those sort of really 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 small companies in that space, even though they might be really mm. revenue pure. You know they might that's all they might do, but you don't want to go too too deep. And then the last one is is sort of the time frame. You, you know these have to be long term. Thematics. They have that. You know, to your point on the fad, you just can't be throwing that stuff and going hoping for the best. And you know, these the, whilst they might be to a certain degree tradable, that's not what they're that's not what they're here for. They are long term, so they are around longevity. Find them now, you know, evergreen. I prefer them to be evergreen. You know, are, are they going to continue to move? Um, what we talk a lot about here, I'm sort of laboring this point. I'm doing it on purpose, but um, is the S curve. So you probably know the S curve yeah. around technology adoption. So, so every part of that technology and S-curve, and, and we've got some of this stuff um, through our website and some of the presentations we do, mm -hmm. is where particular thematics will sit along that S-curve. So what that will show you is if, um, if hydrogen is really at the start of that S-curve, especially green hydrogen, well, there's going to be more risk return as your profile happens. But as adoption kicks in, that, that's when growth kicks in, that's when revenue more kicks in. So... Again, as you start to build portfolios, you start to look at those timeframes and how that works for what you think is the right thing. So anyway, go back to the point. Those are the three sort of things we think before we put an ETF out. And I, look, I'm happy to hear your thoughts, but I think yeah. that's kind of relevant for an investor to think about, is that right for me to put in a portfolio as well? Yeah. Um, I don't think I've seen the research on the S-curve with the thematic overall. I don't think many um, – I think conceptually we kind of think that as investors were like – Lithium, um, or maybe maybe let's take uh, green hydrogen. You said yep. people kind of get the sense that this is early, yeah, right. Whereas, like if it's uh, e-commerce, that's further down the path. Like these are profitable businesses, exactly, right. Yep. Um, but that's really interesting that you kind of like map them along that journey, which is a really good framework, as you said. Like the risk reward um, outcomes or probabilities will shift through time. That's pretty cool. Um, and you've got the. And you, I only found this because we were going to talk about this today, um, like uh, an annual like slide deck that just covers all of these in great detail. Mm. Um, I'm looking at one here from last year or this year, it's 123 pages of this research. So um, there's a lot that goes into it, but you can see there, I think that's a really neat way to think about it, like under the high conviction, how you have those three buckets. Yeah. Um, the liquidity thing, I think I did read of that before. Um, how do you control the liquidity risk? Like say if it's like in the underlying and it's there are small companies, are there ways that you can protect investors by, I don't know, say like you having the index and someone else not having it? Oh, this, this is, oh, we get a little bit technical here around the, the construction of you know, how index providers work with, with ETF providers. And that's, yep. that's certainly there's lots of partnerships that go on there. What, what you'll find though is, and I think there's, there's a bit of a learned experience because um, you look at the, the, the BlackRock and again, the Vanguards, um, and they're so big now in terms of, mm. you, know, you know, there's been so much research about so active versus passive and, and some of the proponents of active obviously like to point to passive and say- This is exactly the point, yeah. Yeah, this is actually going to create a problem, you know, if everyone wants to exit, you know, you've got a small door. But I think, I think the evidence of that probably doesn't stack up certainly in the broad-based indexes, because we've had COVID. Uh, we mm. had problems with massive problems with um, the so fixed income and credit markets. Didn't really cause a huge run on to, to the follow through of that. And, you know, equity markets, they were, you know, you know they were down at some, if, if we can remember, if, if you want to remember, it's not going to be fun, <laughs> but, you know, 6 or 7% at the time. And again, it didn't have that sort of flow effect because the market's deep enough. Where the markets aren't deep enough, Owen, is, is in those smaller companies. So what you might want to do as part of the index construction, and we as ETF providers will work with index providers on this because, you know, we're the proponents of this post going sort of live, is saying, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to cap um, to the market cap, the size of the company, how big the company is, so the market capitalization, 
at 200 million or it has to have we use it we use a an acronym called adv so average daily volume above a certain number mm-hmm. um, there's no no magic number for any of this stuff but above a certain number and and a couple of those points combined what that will do is it will give you the comfort that you're never going to fall into that bucket of buying these really small companies that then spike with an ETF coming online and everyone buying it or, or they'll dip with up in something that's the same way. And I think that's what happened with the with the clean energy one. Um, it, it did have some rules around that. So don't get me wrong, it did have some rules, but maybe they were just a little bit, they just needed to be tweaked a bit and they did do that. So mm. um, I think that was an S&P index. You know, they came out and they tweaked those rules to fix those problems to make sure that that wouldn't happen again. Mm. So I, th- I think investors... This is a broad-based comment, so I take it, take it with a grain of salt, but I think they can have some level of comfort with reputable ETF providers that they are thinking like that yeah. um, going forward. Yeah, I think so too. Um, you know, large ETF providers, at least here in Australia, are extremely well regulated. Um, like we were talking before about the process of like the legal and regulatory process of getting something to market. Mm. Is, you know, it seems more complex than ever, but it's important. Um, the thing that I always... Uh, you know, I have some gripes with some ETFs. I've got to be honest with you, but like I, there are some ETFs that come to market. I just look at them like, you know, and you can know probably what I'm talking about. Um, and from an investor's perspective, um, you're like, okay, yeah, great. Um, you get lots of questions on these, but as the like the expert in this space, how do you, how do investors? So you went through like what you think about, but how do you? How would an investor actually think about, all right, there's a bunch of these different thematics I want to get exposure to, but which one is like the best expression of that for me? And is this the right way to play? Like how can, is there like a checklist or something you can think about that kind of like guides people through this? Yeah, look, I think, <clears throat> again, you, you, I can put my advisor hat on and think about the work that you have to do. I think no one should shy away. And look, anyone listening to this podcast is not shying away from having to do research and work around what's right for them as a portfolio. Mm. But I think there's any, again, going back to, there's no magic formula that you yeah. put these things in and then out pops the best ETF and that, like it's, it's not going to work that way because every ETF is going to be different for you. You're going to have a different viewpoint um, around that. So for, I'll give you I'll give you a real life example. My work, my wife works for um, a small fashion label in e-commerce. So I get a, I get a bit of an insight into that space mm. and does that make me better or worse in terms of being biased towards e-commerce, or or, or not? No, or, or see something. She might use a particular company like Shopify. That'll be in, a, in an e-commerce ETF, obviously. Um, but does that make me biased because now I think that I know all this stuff about which I don't? Obviously, I, don't, I know nothing. Um, it's much more confusing than what we're doing here. Um, or does it then? You know, and then I say, oh well, we've already, we've already got exposure to that, whatever it may be. But I think what it comes down to, and this is any investment. I think ETF particularly, it is that due diligence. So look under the hood, what am I actually getting? Because the good thing about ETFs, and I think any of your um, listeners would know this, is that it's transparent. That's that's yeah, like, that's, the, that's, the that's, yeah. that, that's the key thing. <clears throat> it's giving you access to things you normally wouldn't buy. So international access to, again, if, if we're going to use e-commerce and Shopify as an example, um, you know, you're probably not going to go and buy that individually yourself. So it gives you exposure to that by, by utilizing it through Australia. Um, but you need to know if you underneath the hood that you know, uh, and I don't expect investors to look under underneath the hood of an ETF and all these companies and go, do I need to go and do research on all these companies? No, you don't. That's going to be too much. There's a level of trust in, the, in that theme. But yeah. partly what we're trying to do, and going back to the earlier point, is help around bringing research to um, and try to not be overly biased in one direction because that's not that's not research. That's just propaganda. But bringing content and insights and research mm. that says, hey, you obviously have some interest in this because you're reading it. By you reading this, is going to give you some sort of insight around, is this right for me? Mm. So I think I think doing that, I think, but I think we'll probably take a step back as well. Like let's think about ETFs in general as a process to look at. I'm assuming you've done this many times in the past around ETF selection. Mm. I know it's kind of your sweet spot. Um but there's so many things that you need to think about. And, you know, if you use a checklist, um, I think I did read that book, that checklist manifest so many years yeah, ago. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think it, I think it generally crazy. works. It's certainly more in, the, in, in, the, in the, that mentality. It was about um, in, in surgery in a hospital, but we can do it. We can do it here. Um, so I think looking underneath the hoods, so doing the DD is obviously number one. 
that's yep. you know if you if you do that and you start to get get away from you and that's not what you want to do, then you can walk away. I think and say that's not the right investment for me. Then my investment might go up, but it's just not the right investment for you. Yeah. Then I think it's sort of understanding the structure as well to a certain degree. I think in Australia now, <clears throat> we do have quite a few different structures in place. So mm. you've got a situation of, and we mentioned it earlier a little bit, that active-passive debate of, and we know now that there's quite a lot of active ETFs in the market. You've also got listed investment companies. They have different benefits and and um, uh, and, and issues. Um yeah. On both sides, so you know, I'm not leaning either way. Either way. So again, what the best structure to invest through that might be? Um, that's one thing. Uh, again, if active or passive is the best way. If there's a, if you, you have a true belief that in that certain space that you don't want to have any level of expertise and you'd rather a trust an um, you know, investment professional to pick the stocks. Again, that's where active works. You're going to probably pay more for sure. That's that's the sort of space. So. And then, but then you've got commodities. Obviously, you know, we mentioned gold before. That's such a key part of what we do. Um, the difference between, you know, a commodity and an equities-based version that mines can really important. I get that question all the time, and, yeah. and, it, and, it's, and it's very valid because you're going to get different risks, but you're going to get different upsides. So if you're if you're buying gold uh, in GOLT, for example, you know you know you're getting access to the physical bullion. You know where it is. It's stored in a, in a vault. If you're buying gold miners, you know what you're going to get is you might get. Uh, the CEO leaving one day, but you also might get an exploration that pops up. And so you're going to get this again, risk and, just risks and benefits. You know what, what, what's what's the good and bad parts of all those sort of things. And then I think this comes back to the inherent underlying of, of ETFs again, kind of compared to listed investment companies. But it's mm. the tracking, tracking across. You know, is the ETF that you're buying actually doing what you thought it was going to do? Like, yeah, for sure. Because <clears throat> I think what happens a lot of the time is is you buy something. And then you look at it and you just trust that it hopefully it is. But if, when, you know, especially in a portfolio, it's hard to sort of start to discern. You know, I think, I think actually we're getting a little top, off topic here. But for many sort of retail investors, it is somewhat, if you've got a portfolio, it's somewhat hard to compare that to what, like what benchmark? What, yeah. what are you comparing it to? Have you done well? To, to what? Yeah. I think the second part of that point is, is have you done well compared to what your strategy you put in place at the start of what you're doing now? What I found back in my old days of advising is um, that a lot of investors actually don't have a strategy. What they do is they just continually buy mm. an add-on. So you're layering, incrementally layering. And I think it happens a little bit with thematics as well because what you'll do is you'll have a portfolio, something will catch your interest around thematics and you go, you know, I want to add that in. Yeah, but that's great. But has it got overlap with other parts of your portfolio? Is it actually not giving you any upside uh, potential and I think my point here is some of the tools that are available for, for investors aren't that great in this space. You know, a lot of the online brokers probably don't provide. You know, some of them do a little bit of health check stuff and they have ETF screeners or those sorts of things. But, you know. It is hard to get that information. It's really, it's really hard. Yeah. So what, what would be great, and, and some Excel whiz I'm sure has done this already, is you break out all the uh, underlying holdings and have a look at overlaps of, across all your portfolio, those sorts of things would be, yeah. would be awesome. Not, I'm not providing a solution here. I'm providing a problem. So <laughs> yeah. don't get me wrong. Um, <clears throat> but I think you know, and then under, so going back to the point, you know, doing doing all that work, which is probably too much for a lot of people, but um, but make I think going back, hold hold the ETF provider accountable because when you're tracking an index and it's a really large fund like uh, SP two hundred ASX, uh, uh, sorry ASX two hundred um, S and P five hundred, mm. it's it, look, it's becoming it's pretty. It's not easy, but it's 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 you know the, the companies are doing that have a pretty good grasp on that and yeah. you should get really close it should be really really close it should be basically bang on minus the um the fee yeah. you're paying and the fees are quite low in that space what you're going to get with thematic is you're probably getting a little bit a little bit different because the, look you probably are going to get pretty close from a tracking uh difference point of view between the underlying index mm. of that particular etf and the thematic okay so if you're investing in <clears throat> gold yep um, the tracking difference is going to be really close. If you're investing in ACDC with, say, lithium battery tech, I think the tracking difference is also going to be pretty close. But what's the tracking that is compared to a broader market index? That's what you're going to have to have a look at. I think that, that's an important thing to know because what you're taking on when you're investing in thematics is inherently either more risk because the upside is, you know, the potential is probably greater 
uh, sorry, return, and then the risk is obviously downside potentially greater because you're, you've got a narrow, narrow focus. Inherently, if you've got a narrow focus through one theme, the likelihood is that yeah, you're getting more risk around that. So I think it just, just, you know, I've kind of gone off topic a little bit there and sort of come back, come back to it. But I think just from a listener's point of view, that's the kind of program I would think about mm. as doing the work to get to that level of, okay, I'm comfortable with this. And I'm, because you know, the important part is you're going to be holding this for a long term. I would suspect they are. Yeah, and you I don't want to get it wrong up front, right? Exactly, right? So this is your chance. Yeah. This is your chance to get it right. Um, and I think a lot of the, uh, the ETF providers do provide a lot of good information on their websites around this. And I think, again, going back to that research point, hopefully we can even give you more level of detail that one layer down to say, yep, yeah, that's right for me or that's wrong for me. Yeah. I, um, I still end up going like time and again to the ETF providers website like one by one to check holdings. Um, and I like to, like obviously I'm the, the kind of guy that gets in the weeds a bit, but um, and there are tools like Morningstar um, mm. provides a tool um, which you can, I think you may have to pay to get access to. Um, it's not too bad. But at, at the same time, like a lot of people, at least in that kind of like the self-directed space, um, need to be consciously making that choice. It's not just like I get a lot of people like, well, I've got this CTF, I've got this CTF, and they're just layering it on top yeah. of that. I like to think of it as a collector. It's like someone who just buys and never sells or like yeah. doesn't actually think. They just kind of store it all and you end up with so much overweight and underweight and certain things you never even thought. But the big one for me in thematics is actually the the tracking area. And it's not so much with equities because that's, like you said, it's kind of a well-worn path, but it's more like the when there's derivatives involved. Yeah. Like you, you start to get this kind of weird outcome and people think like they're trading some sort of futures contract and it's like oh, you know you look over a year maybe they're not designed for that but it's a little bit of a different outcome mm. and so i think this is a really good list of things um together with the info that you got on the site um there is i guess the one thing that i really wanted to get to with you mate is diving into some themes um and just i guess walking through them if we can like stepping through them about and just how you think about breaking them down, whether those through those buckets, yep. um, what you're excited about. Like in the US, Global X has a huge range of thematic ETFs. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's three, maybe three yeah. that you're kind of interested in or that have been well established and are exciting. Um, I think our listeners will get a lot of value from that. Yeah, I think, I think, it's, look, I think it's a good point. We were actually having a conversation with the research team last week around and we were sort of talking them through what, what we want to do from the Australian perspective we want to bring those sort of mm. um we've got you know we've got a really ambitious product pipeline because we want to make sure the Australian investors are serviced as well as the as the US ones were uh and we we're sort of talking to them about the research and they made a really strong point I think this sort of leverage is not what we're going to say they're like research has nothing to do with products but the research is so independent yeah right we're agnostic to product we help we, we want to provide research that is you know best in class and it's not like obviously they're doing it because they want to support the business and it's you know mm. they their, their intent is to we're a, we're a fund manager we want to sell products i get that but um it was really nice to see how hard that chinese wall was up it was it was it was very strong so i think hopefully we can elevate that down here so anyway that, that was just a one point yeah. I think, no that's fair enough that. yeah i didn't realize um that. I, I think uh look i think we'll take it from a little bit of a lens of what we hear most from investors and I, my my this might be good or bad because you might be you might have already done this a thousand times before but i think it's still relevant to, re, to revisit this because maybe there's one soundbite or one insight mm. that we can sort of bring to light that an investor goes you know that's that's, that's, that's a good point um and they might already be a holder they might be thinking about what they want to do sure so i think uh first of all I think, um, and we, we we have been talking to a lot of um, investors and advisors about this over the last couple of couple of months um, post the rebrand. One would be robotics and AI, and I think the reason this is exciting, I think the reason that we'll do three, but I think the reason them all because the question is, as we are now with the market, mm. you know, is this an opportunity to buy? And I'm, not, I'm certainly not giving any advice. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. just going to sort of frame it as that um, because you've got a situation where some of these thematics are depressed it's it's it's, it's yeah. inevitable uh, and especially the technology so if we stick with the technology theme say through these studies i i think a lot of them are very very depressed in terms of their um their valuations 
Um, uh, obviously, that inherently puts pressure on their prices. So what these names were, I'm sure you may read with all these growth names. Yeah. Um, have, they, have they now fallen into value stocks? Like, we, you know, this yeah, is, this yeah, is what it basically comes to. Yeah. yeah, so if we stick to robotics and AI, I think we, we've had some really good insights around uh, so one of the partners, partners we work with with the ETF is a, it's a company called Robo Global out of the states, and they went they went to a recent show I think it was in Detroit, um, and we're talking to a lot of these robotic companies. And, and if you take a step back on robotic companies, there's, there's sort of there's some big buckets, but there's you know those sort of ones that sort of build industrial robots. I'm going to give you some examples of the stocks if you like. Um, sure. Surgical is another one. It's, mm-hmm. it's really a growing space. Uh, agricultural, you know, think like think about John Deere. That, that, you know, they were an industrial business for many years, and now they're kind of quasi AI business because that's what they're thinking. Yeah. Um, but what 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 the what the elements come out of that that show that they went to, and some of the insights were order books for robotic businesses are as strong as they've ever been. They're over twelve months long, and part of that is so we're in an environment now of of inflation. If, you, if, you, if you're not in inflation, if you don't understand what's going on in inflation, I think you'd be hiding on a rock. You wouldn't be listening to this. It just wouldn't yeah. happen. And what comes generally with inflation is sort of wage growth. And we did a, we did, we did some research on uh, the wage growth through China, which is hugely like in terms of if you went sort of back sort of circa 15 years, you're talking about something in the vicinity of 400% of wage growth. Hmm. Whereas if you went to the US, it's still sort of circa 50%, which is a lot. It's a lot, you know. Um, but then robotics, especially industrial robotics, the the prices have gone down. So if you've got an, you're in an inflationary environment, wage, wages are going up. If you're a, a business now, not a car manufacturer, they've been doing this for years. You know, mm. they, we'd all seen the photo, the, the videos of them with the uh, amazing robots building cars. There is a bunch of space in the industrial world that has hasn't moved there yet, and they are getting there. This is where these order books are, and the ability for these robotic companies to pass through the prices. I think that's the important part. So when you've got inflation, you've got, mm. you've got, you've got um, material inflation, commodities have come off, thankfully, so that's obviously the inputs, but um, or wage inflation, if that can go through to the to the end consumer, which obviously then creates more inflation because it can pass the way through, but robotics are essentially are built to be deflationary. Because if you think about what they're doing is they're creating um, efficiency and productivity by mm. either being better at what, a, what, the, what they happen if it, rather than human or creating less errors, so I think the upside of that is significant. We see that, you know, that would probably, this whole space is probably likely to get to double in the next sort of, sort of circa seven years. Hmm. Uh, I think, you know, a couple of, a couple of names, if, I know, I know um, investors like to know sort of some names in this space. There's one that's really interesting out of Japan called Fanuc. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think, yeah, again, go have a look at some of like, what, what I'll tell you two names. So there's Fanuc in the industrial space, another one called um, Intuitive in the sort of surgical uh, intuitive robotic surgical, space. Intuitive, yeah. If you, uh, don't pause the podcast and go away. Listen to the whole thing. <laughs> come back. But go and watch this video uh, on YouTube by Intuitive. And we're, I'm jumping here. I'll, I'll talk to you about what Intuitive does. But they essentially build, um, you know, surgical assisted robotics for for operations. Yeah. And there's this one amazing video of the machine peeling a grape. Yeah, I've seen it, that. Have you yeah. seen that? Yeah. It's, it's like it's uh, it's incredible. So, um, <laughs> you know, you know. Um, the good thing about many of these companies, you get to know, you know, especially if they're US listed, you get to know what's happening all the time. So, so surgical are coming out with their um, with their numbers very soon uh, in terms of what they're happening. But they they've sold, I think, circa seven million. Uh, so they've done circa seven million operations. There's sort of around seven thousand uh, of these robots, and that that's a huge investment for mm. a, you know for a, for a hospital to do that. So whether you're investing, you know, you're buying a robotic arm for your industrial business, or you're putting in any type of robot. Through, through medical cases, there's a lag there. It takes time to train people. You know, you've got to get people across the line. Um, so I guess this is also the thing, you know, if these, if these companies are getting depressed in price, know that, the, that these order books are still strong and the lag of actually how this is going to keep through to their underlying revenues is going to take some time. Yeah. So I think that, that, that space is really interesting. Um, as, as sort of one. I think the second might be, and I think you, you probably would have done this um, until you're blue, but I think the, the future of mobility is so drastic as a theme that when you look at it on that S curve, it really is. And I, let me just give you the buckets of that S curve if you haven't looked it up. But it starts as innovators, early majority, late majority, and then it sort of gets into that sort of laggards. And yep. you know, we really see is this sort of 
this shift in mobility being that really early early majority stage. Like it's, it, it is, this is not, you know, it's it's so everywhere and there's so many articles on it. There's so many bits and pieces on it. This obviously, you know, there's now a showroom for a new Spanish um, electric vehicle brand down here in Sydney oh, right. in the city. There used to be one in, in Martin Place for, for Tesla. Um, we think it's everywhere, but it's still very early days. So I think when you think about that shift, I think the important part is where do you want to play across the supply chain? Mm. So the supply chain is essentially um, – certainly doing this at a high level, you know, the lithium mining, which we're very well aware of in Australia, the names you're probably also aware of, the, the Pilbara's and the, and the mineral resources and the, yep. the oil camps. <clears throat> then you've got the manufacturers, which probably isn't, that's not the sweet spot of Australia. I know we're trying to think we can do that, um, but probably isn't the sweet spot of Australia. That's more the Chinese and, and to the Asian markets. Mm. And then you've got the electric vehicle space. So you've got this whole supply chain. So you can either play those supply chains individually or you can go bucket them as the whole mobility ev battery tech kind of thematic i think the problem there's a problems at all parts of of that supply chain and there's benefits you know the good things about all parts of that supply chain i think lithium wise and we've done a lot of work on this the the deficit from a supply and and demand Mm. program that's happening is this the, the deficit and the imbalance there is so significant that unless something happens in the very near future that that it's just going to be out of whack, and you, we all know how high lithium prices are. Like it's that's not a secret for anyone. Everyone's seen that. You know, if you think of, if you look at the commodities price chart mm. year to date, everything's down. Lithium's up. Yeah, it's been the one. Yeah. It's been the one. Um, and hopefully, many of your investors have benefited from that. I think it's it's obviously been a great investment. Um, but the, the, the but the demand coming from electric vehicles. If you think about what lithium was used from before, like if you had a battery to phone, it's it's this big. Yeah, it's you like have a battery. Teaspoon. Exactly, teaspoon, you have a battery yeah. in a car. It's you know we're talking about you know significant amount more. So the demand supply balance out of whack. And if you're um, a lithium miner, this is gonna doesn't take five minutes to get a mine off the ground. You, you know you need to do feasibility studies. You need to look at the price. You need to predict the price in three to five years when this thing's going to come online. So we're in we're in a bit of a delay there. I think. That's got a flow through effect for the next two parts of the supply chain. So battery manufacturers having to buy lithium at a much higher price. Thankfully, the technology in that space is getting much, much better. I'm sure you've probably done this in the past, like looked at that technology again out of China. <clears throat> um, you're seeing just like leaps and bounds in terms of battery prices coming down, even in the fact that the inputs are going up. Yep. And then I think the third part back of that is the is the electric vehicles. I think I think the, the dominating part of that is just Tesla, and whether that's just uh, Musk or not, but uh, or out of China BYD. But I think if you look at the traditional um, car manufacturers, they're all coming up the curve. That you know, and you talk about the BMWs, uh, Daimlers and Mercedes, Renault, uh, Renault yeah, um, you know. I read, a, I read a point on Ford the other day that, you know, obviously with the with the F-150 Lightning, mm. they've raised prices twice in the last three months and the, and the delay or the wait list is still three years. Wow. So the demand is there and the pass-through of these costs is seemingly getting absorbed. So that's basically an elastic market that, can, that gets absorbed because the demand is so strong. So I think, you know, that is such an interesting space. And if you put, again, putting that in the context of the S-curve being such early days, you know, you look around here and I don't know about Melbourne, what Melbourne's like, Owen, but like there's not that many electric vehicles no. cruising around. Yeah. The infrastructure isn't great here, so there's a massive amount of spend that needs to be in that space. Um, you go to California, different ball game. You go to Europe, it's a different ball game. So, you know, I think we're probably a little bit sheltered. We're very well aware of the lithium side, but we're not as well aware of the move towards the actual vehicle side. So, again, where you want to play that curve, I think it's important. Mm. So, I think that that's, that's a couple of ideas. Yep. I think the last one, and you can call this a thematic, or you can call it what, <clears throat> but we'll stick with the with the I think the technology theme is <clears throat> is semiconductors, and I think the interesting part of this space is, I, and the reason I brought this up today is on that point I made earlier around valuations. Yeah, like you know, I'm sure anyone brings up a chart of some of the semiconductor companies. Um, they are absolutely savage. They've, been, they've yeah. been sold off so significantly. They make up around, it would have been more, but they make, I think they make up around sort of circa 12% of the NASDAQ, for example. We know the NASDAQ's yeah. been, been sold off. So, so, so semiconductors having a rally is going to help the broader water market. And they're a bit of a conduit to the tech space anyway. Um, but I, I think, you know, with those valuations, there is still some bright spots. 
in that space. So the, the names that you, your your, um, your your listeners would know, so the Nvidia's, uh, the Intel's. I'm going to ask a question. What 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 do you think? What's the bigger company? Is it Nvidia or Intel? I well, I'm going to say Nvidia because it's done so well. But I, you know, the stock that I just pulled up as you said that was TSMC. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this is again, this is a supply chain process. Um, where you've got, um, so you, you know, you're right, NVIDIA is bigger, but yes. it's a bigger by, I think, I don't know the exact number today, but it's circa sort of three three times, which would, mm. I, I think, blow a lot of people away because Intel is probably something that you buy a new PC, it's the stickers on your, on your you know, the little yeah. thing of what you get, and they sort of talk to it a lot. I know, I, I thought it was interesting when I looked at it. Um, yeah, it's $284 billion for NVIDIA and $100 billion for Intel. Yeah. There's a massive difference. Yeah, huge. And that probably has a little bit of leverage into that old COVID space and the crypto mining and, and using yeah. and GPUs instead of CPUs. But I won't sort of go into that level of detail, but there is a move around that kind of difference in what parts of a computer are going to drive the performance going forward. So, you, you know, again, supply chains. So you've got um, Intel, which do everything. Uh, they design and manufacture, and I think they are getting into those graphic um, processing units, the GPUs. Um, you got Nvidia who designs but doesn't manufacture. And you got um, uh, TMSC who is yeah. basically the manufacturer of the world. But the problem in this space is uh, whether you use sort of barriers of entry or use moat as your mentality of thinking about it, the, the moat or barriers of entry in this space is is, is unattainable. It's it's essentially done because mm. who's going to want to build like TMSC a twenty billion dollar facility mm. and where are your customers going to come from when it's basically all these programs are set? Like where, what's going to happen? Yeah. Where's it going to come from? So, you know, that is somewhat a monopoly market. So you've got a situation where you need to understand the underlying components of some of these, um, Some, you know, if, again, if it's an ETF that you're looking to look at that industry, that, that's interesting. Um, so, yeah, the, the, again, componentry of that. So buying one particular company, this is going back to the diversification. We didn't actually talk about that around, how you, everyone yeah. knows about how ETFs work, but yeah. the diversification part, what parts of, the, of either, talk about lithium, supply chain, or in a case of semiconductor, for example, where do you want to be mm. involved? Do you want to buy one company and buy NVIDIA or does Intel have a research? I, I certainly don't know. But, you know, do you want to be across both parts of that industry? Um, but I think there is some bright spots sort of starting to show around, again, things like order books um, across things like TMSC. That they're, they're a really good sort of conduit yeah. for the market. <clears throat> I think I sort of stat they expect to have i think it's i'm not sure it was sales revenue but something on that on the lines of up around 40 percent. so again that's probably priced into the market so nothing major but the the numbers are there yes there has been pc slowdowns these sorts of things but you know the space of all this sort of disruptive technology where it's moving has been under so much pressure this is the i think the point of raising these three particular ideas is that without giving not advice but the opportunities for investors who are looking long term may start to present themselves at some point mm. there may be downside there might be more downside not to say that um but you know the opportunities again for a long-term investor you can start to think about oh, is this somewhere i want to buy or play or have something that's part of my portfolio mm, the acdc yeah um i was chatting to the team the other day about this uh that it is really well i guess diversified through the supply chain and the kind of the value chain as well yeah um, I guess if you think about that, you know how we've gone talking about the S curve before the future of mobility. Where, like, I don't know if you've gotten this off the top of your head or not. Um, but where would where do you think we are in that curve? Do you think it's still very early? Yeah. So the look, our research is that it's early because <clears throat> again, you're separating a few things here. You, you, Lithium is not a technology per se. It's obviously no. a mineral. Yeah. So it's not going to sit on an S curve. In, in, in all technicality because yeah maybe the mining can get a bit better but it's not gonna that's not the game changer you know a miner might be able to reduce costs and then deliver better but it's not a technology so i think the technology parts of those two of this whole value chain would be the battery technology so mm. how lithium ion is produced you know range these sorts of things you know um charging um and then the evs is how that input works together the software that goes into place so i think if you put those two buckets together um, I'd say battery technology is still, you know, probably in the innovator days. Um, electric vehicle, because it's still a car. Yep. It's a car. It's got wheels. You know, it's got a steering wheel. I think I think Tesla's have steering wheels. I'm not sure what they've <laughs> got in there. Um, but they're probably a little bit further up the curve. But they're both very much in those early days. So whether it's early majority or an innovator stage, they're very much in those early days. 
Um, again, mm. I think that doesn't feel very intuitive because there's so much going on around them. But if you think about it in the concept of um, mobile phones or the internet, it's, it's kind of that same, you know, the, you know, they don't have the network effect like the internet would have done because it's not, doesn't that make a difference, but it kind of does in, in its own way with charging stations, you know, that's what charging stations are or, or the infrastructure for, sure. for that. So, yeah, I, I, I'm very much like in it, right on the border of, in, um, of that innovators side, which is really that really low point of the S curve and the early majority. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, early days, early days. Um, so, like these three buckets, um, these three themes are, are pretty well established. Like we're talking about just as a like an example is like lithium as a as a investment theme or sector or however you want to frame it that's like been very very popular in 2022 as you said like it's the one commodity that's up and to the right you know um now i'm going to ask you to stare into your crystal ball a little bit and ask you you know obviously this is just like your calculated bets on like what's going to be interesting in 2023 to a lot of mm. investors but what do you see on the horizon is something that's emerging um in the zeitgeist of the investors but even just in like in just various industries what keeps bubbling up well i think this is where you can start to think about the technological side that's the, that's one side that again it depends on what, where, what your world view is you know some of these robotics ai etc they're going to keep getting little things pop up because again i think the early days you, you know, if you're looking at it as a media, as a source of information, consistently you're going to see innovation mm. pop up and big innovation. Whereas if you're at the back end of that S curve, what you're not get, what you're not getting is major innovation. You're getting incremental innovation. So an iPhone, for example, I'm going to answer a question. I promise. I'm yeah, just, no, I'm, going, I'm getting around to it. Um, but the iPhone, you know, it's incremental. Yeah, it's not, it's not innovating. So I think where the exciting things for 2023 are probably, I think the you know, certainly maybe not semiconductors. It's certainly a, it's certainly much more um, incremental now. Um, it's more evaluation play, um, but the other two are certainly still headline innovation in, in the innovation space. I think, and we can talk about this in, in greater detail if you want. But I think where the next sort of shift is, uh, this is all encompassing across everywhere, is that sort of climate shift that we're seeing as well. That that is without question. You know, at the forefront of pretty much every investor, mm. certainly younger investors, and it should be compared to say older investors. But and I'm not saying that all older investors aren't concerned about that. But mm, anecdotally, sure. he thinks that they're not as concerned. They're, they're retired. They, they need money to survive. So it could be it's more important on performance. But you know that that I think is as a broad encompassing point, and the underlying of what that looks like is, you know, that you know, just to say climate. That's that's a very broad, broad brush yeah. stroke of what we're looking at. So you can really start to dig down. Uh, and not only what you can do as, a, as an individual, but how you can invest in that space. I think that that's the interesting side, more for me anyway. Um, you know, yeah, sure, you can have shorter showers, turn lights off, that's all valid. But if you want to try to benefit and work in that in that world, well, I think there's certainly ways to do that still. And, mm-hmm. and, and there's going to be more to come, I would suspect. But how does that – so this is a really good um, – I guess, example or use case. Like, how do you then take, because I like me and millions of other people around the world agree with you, right? Like that a focus on climate is important. And I'm increasingly hearing more fundies, more investors, more researchers talking about, yeah, this isn't, this is a problem, but you can make money from it. This is, can mm. be a positive thing. It doesn't have to be like cost everyone everything. Um, the, through innovation, you can make money, right? Yeah. So, how do you take that concept, right? And this is a kind of the, 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 the thrust of this episode, this conversation is like, how do you take that and then put it into ETFs? Like, how do you make that available? Yeah, and let's go back to that thematic point we, we made earlier, I think, and we can, <clears throat> we can sort of draw this out a little bit. But I think it goes back to that mentality. It shouldn't be a negative to try to, to derive uh, wealth out of, out of a change or shift or, you know, where, you know, Mm. A paradigm shift that we're seeing, and climate is one of them. Um, it's, it's you know, it's kind of like you know when, when Apple raises the price of its iPhone all it's all the time, and their margins go up. Well, why don't you buy some Apple stock and, and benefit from that as well? Like that's kind yeah. of thing. Play along with the game. Yeah. Um, but I think I think there's a couple of ways you can play the climate change world, and I think what, what the big move that's happened over the last couple of years has obviously been ESG. So that's that's broader than just climate change. That that's that's 
that's a specific sort of bucket. And what we've seen certainly institutionally is that if you're a super fund, it's certainly definitely the case in Europe uh, or you're even Australia, the expectations is you have really good understanding of what that means um, for the investment program that mm. you have. So if you, I've seen a lot of things with like, you know, whether it's Aussie Super or all, all the big super funds we have here, they all have a, obviously an E or ethical option. Yeah. Um, we have ethical only type of fund managers as well. Um, so I think that's sort of one way that people can sort of get exposure or, or feel good about what they what their investment process is. And that's not sure. really, really what your question is. So but I think from an ETF, you can play it a couple of ways. One is you can do that ESG type mentality. Mm -hmm. So you can say, uh, I'm going to do the negative screening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, negative training being, I'm going to take out companies that I don't like or associate with or don't want. It gets complicated pretty quickly because mm. what what is right for you might not be right for someone else. It, this is a very, very subjective space. Yeah. Like this is, I think, and this is partly the problem is where you've got S&P 500, that's not subjective. It's it's objective as you can get. It's market. Well, it's actually tight, slightly, but you know the index rules. But essentially, it's market cap. Yep. Biggest companies go to the top. With ESG and climate change and um, and sustainability in general, I think it's just such a minefield for for one investors looking at what they want to buy, and two for fund managers trying to bring the right product or the right solution to investors as well. So, if you're using negative screens, what's right for me, Owen, Peter, what's right for you might be very different. Yeah. Um, and then go back to your earlier question on ETS, one might have, you know, if you go and take out essentially everything, that's going to have a, a really large tracking error or difference compared to the underlying index. So I think when we think about how we would bring um, an ETF to life in this space, it has to be, it has to be, I think, even more considered because you're going to need to sort of do those three steps with the, the you know, the high conviction, the investability and the, and the time frame. Um, and then you need to start to take into consideration what truly is green. You know, mm. if it's going to be green, what is it? Is it light green, dark green? Like how dark you want to go? There is sort of the, there's, a, there's a spectrum here. Mm. So I'm not, I'm not I'm not answering your question well because I think the answer would take it would take you know we'd be sitting here for the next three days. I think because there's so much to this. Um, but I think essentially going back to the high level, you can buy ESG, so so essentially screened versions, so things getting things taken out. Um, you can buy positive screen now. There's not actually that many in Australia. Um, there's more in Europe. Or and the place that we're probably going to will likely play in is more in here's a thematic that plays into that world that might again align with what your thinking is mm. from a perspective of uh, investability. So again, not either one of those is, is right for everyone, but that's kind of I think the way the world sort of start to go when it comes to that sort of broad brush stroke of climate. Mm -hmm. I actually so I got a uh, an email this morning. It was an hour, or an hour ago, just as literally you were walking into the office, um, an announcement like the green metals, uh, green green miners ETF. Yeah, is that what it is? Yep. Yeah, green metal miners ETF. Um, so there, like that's kind of like <laughs> partly answered my question as well, right? Like, there's an expression of this um, yeah. taking place. Yeah, there is, there is there's an expression of this. I think you, you know you might look at look. I mean, we can discuss that. I think that's that's a good good point. But um, whether it's what part of the transition around and we know that the biggest point that everyone sort of focuses, especially in Australia with coal, we're, we're, we're coal exporters, we're coal users, is sort of energy use and that transition from traditional energy use to you know what is what is renewables, whatever it may be. So whether that's um, hydrogen is there certainly a space. It's again S curve. You know, always think about the S curve when it comes to thematics. Very early days. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, or if you're talking about green metals. You know what? What does that even actually mean? Like, what is, what's a green metal? Like, yeah. the, I think the concept is probably a little bit foreign to someone. So, as a very brief explanation, these are metals or minerals that are going to play a role or play play the role in moving from an old coal fired power plant to renewable energy. So, wind farms, so um, solar panels, these sorts of yeah. these sorts of things, infrastructure that drives the outcomes of that, charging stations. So what what are the metals that are going to do that? Uh, it's not coal. I'll give you that tip. I'm pretty sure everyone would figure that out pretty pretty early on. <laughs> um, but it's things like copper, things like aluminium, obviously lithium in in, in batteries, um, zinc. You know, so they're always going to have multiple use cases. 
traditional use cases, but they're also going to have new use cases. And that's the, that's the differentiation around where previously you were in terms of what we used to use metals for and what we're going to use metals for now. Mm. I think that's the thing, right? People, uh, I heard someone, I think it was yesterday, someone said to me the day before, you know, um, people driving around Teslas, they still need aluminium. You still need yeah, these yeah. other things, right? So um, there's more to it than just, you know, screening out everything, every part of mining. I think that's a something that a lot of people are waking up to and say, you know, there's a lot more to it than just don't do this, don't do that. Like there's different, there's shades of gray in between all of that. Well, we got to, we got to, we got to build like the infrastructure. And I'm personally not, not have any skill set. You know, an engineer's got to build this infrastructure. And you got to, I think, you can't really just have this blanket rule that all mining is bad, mm. because that is part. Of, it's part of the solution to moving to what we want to move to. I think, like anecdotally, you start to, to, I think, to bring to life a little bit, you can sort of say, okay, I think copper is a good one because copper traditionally been used in things like houses, yeah, uh, you know, certain you know, telecommunications, these sorts of things, um, which certainly aren't necessarily built around around a climate shift or a change or, or, or sustainable investing. Um, but now what the what the shift is, if you so I think I think the stats are. Don't quote me on this, even though you're potentially going to quote me on this. But um, <laughs> is I think you need sort of circa for for a megawatt of output, you need circa one to one and a half tons of copper in a traditional power plant. I think you need something in the vicinity of eight eight times that, or around eight eight tons of copper right. for uh, a renewable space, more than a renewable space, um, like a, like a uh, a turbine farm, farm, something like that, a wind farm. So the the out the, the need of something like copper. Again, it is a, it's a traditional metal, but if you get to think about where the input's going to be, it's going to go into building renewables. You know, again, another stat uh, would be a traditional car might use circa twenty kilos of copper as part of it. You know, it's obviously built on built with steel and aluminium. An electric vehicle uses somewhere between sort of sixty to eighty kilos of copper. Mm-hmm. So again, that's a that's the shift around where where it's moving. And this comes back to this point we made earlier around lithium. And lithium is part, a part of it, definitely a green metal because it goes into electric vehicles. It's a battery program. So that's obviously key to a shift around the, to the green world. Um, but is the supply and demand program and, and the imbalance that happens on the back of that? So copper's certainly been sold off. It's an economic indicator, essentially. You know, yeah. how, how the world is going is going to be indic- indicative of how copper's sort of moving. But if you look long term, that change is going to shift to not be about necessarily all about that because of the use cases. Of, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of honing on copper here, but you know, I saw a stat from um, HP a little while ago. It said, we're, over the last 30 years of copper output, we're going to need double the amount for the next 30 years because of this transition mm. to different energy sources and energy uses. And that, I think you can say the same across a huge range of these metals. Lithium's one, one we won't talk about anymore, but is the same. Um, aluminium is another one. I, you, you might have seen aluminium in particular has started to move higher. You know, <clears throat> gets produced out of a lot out of Russia. That you know, the US administration starting to think about is that going to be the right thing? You know, are we going to ban you know the next incremental stage on what they're banning out of out of Russia? Might be metals as well. So th- there is such a, it's such a space where um, I think looking forward, making yourself feel good. If you are wanting to invest in particular commodities. And you want to have that uh, mm. that bent towards climate sustainability. This space might be might be relevant for someone like that. Mm. Um, we've covered, covered a lot of ground, mate. We've covered basically how to think about like an ETF being manufactured, how to break apart an ETF if you're looking in a, in a particular theme. Um, you took us through robotics, future of mobility, and how that plays in like lithium batteries, all that sort of stuff, and semiconductors. Um, and you've also told us that, uh, you've also given us a good pub recommendation, um, which I think I'll have to check out along the beach. Uh, but mate, if people wanted to find out, say like where the research goes and, um, all of that, where can they head? Yeah. So the Globex website is now, so obviously it used to be ETF securities. Even if you type that in, obviously it'll, it'll revert, but <clears throat> so globalx.com.au, I think we've got about 15 pieces of, of insights on there at the moment that's going to only increase and we we hope that we can bring things to life like you know it's great sitting down with you someone like you because you i think you help bring things to life in a, in a mm. nice way um 
written words great but you know talking to someone so we want to make sure we produce videos for, the, for people who might want to digest it that way um we're probably not going to do our own podcast that's, <laughs> that's more your space and i'll leave it to you um but i think they can head there and then by all means reach out let us know like let us know what's going to be relevant whether it's through someone like you or whether it's through the website or however you know mm. if, if we're at certain things that 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 a retail investor might be able to grab us and tell us because i think we we're getting a lot out of the states it might not be relevant for Australian investors. We mm. want to we want to make sure it's right. Mm. Um, so we take this very seriously, and we want to make sure that everything we bring out, you know, is not just super American focus, which which, which happens sometimes with some of these big American um, yeah. investment firms. You know, Australians are slightly different, sure, fairly different around how they think. So um, we want to make sure that is the right content insight research for them. Yeah, cool. And I'll put all the link in the show notes. Um, so if you are interested in the the ETFs that we referenced to, uh, check out the show notes. It'll be linked there. Blair, mate, it was a great interview. First, first good knock, mate. I really enjoyed it. So thanks for taking the Thank time you, to join Thank you, Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.